Hey mate, what are you holding there? Did you did you win the gold, did you? No, I won the sliver. And it was supposed to be silver. <laughs> Welcome back to Tech Air City, and what we've got right here is the Vision G Z490 from Gigabyte. And this is coming in at 200 USD, roughly, if you're in Australia, 400 Aussie dollars. And so for this price, you're getting a 12 phase VRM. They're using 50 amp direct drive MOSFETs. And when I did the temperature tests on this with a 10900K at 5.2 gigahertz, I was a little bit uh, sort of surprised with how high it was taking the voltage of the CPU. I was seeing in hardware monitor or hardware info 64, the voltages were going up over 1.55 volt. And that was not happening on the previous board I took a look at, the PG Velocita from ASRock. So this board was taking it at the same voltages as I tested with the other board, over 300 watts power consumption. And that was just too much in my opinion. So I dropped it down to 1.35 volt. And then the voltages I still noticed were bumping up very high in the readouts, but this then enabled the max power draw to go to around 287 watts. So it was higher than the 260 and also 180 watts that we reached on the Velocita. So it is sort of over vaulting the CPU or the VRM is just not as efficient. But speaking of the temperatures of the VRM, they were absolutely fine. We were getting a 80 degree readout in software. Temperatures on the surface went to 86 degrees. This was maximum temperatures, by the way, in a 23 degree ambient environment. And then the heat sink temperatures were doing a very good job, showing that it was soaking up all the heat and they remained just a little over 50 degrees in the test. So basically, out of the box, this thing is going to be geared absolutely fine towards handling a 10900K, taking it to 4.9 gigahertz, all 10 cores. Though if you do want to overclock it, the VRM and also the company heatsink, which weighs about 289 grams, that is going to be absolutely fine as well. You've also got at the top here an eight pin and four pin connector if you need the extra power draw. So summing up the VRM solution here, it's great on the hardware side of things. The implementation of the heatsink's good, but I think uh, they need to go back and retune the BIOS a little bit because it looks like it is overvolting the uh, CPU and that's causing increased power draw, which of course we don't want to see. So moving on with the onboard audio, this is some really good news for Gigabyte here, where the frequency response curve was pretty much perfectly flat. Uh, below 10 hertz, we saw a 2.3 decibel roll off, really minimal. And then on the crosstalk, we were seeing minus 91 decibels. These are some of the best numbers I've seen for crosstalk. So phenomenal job there. And then also on the mic input, there is no noise suppression. So you are getting a pure signal in, but there is heavy noise when you max out the volume plus 30 dB, 100 volume. So taking it down to about 80 volume plus 20 dB, saw a balance of noise, but you'll still have enough power there to power a decent lav mic, say for instance, something like a pop voice. So you'll be able to listen to music really well on mid-range cans, also talk to your friends without noise, providing you drop the volume, but also stream with good voice quality on this included onboard audio solution. They're going through the feature set here, we've got three M.2 slots, where two of those are able to be covered by a heatsink. I will critique Gigabyte here for the actual screw method that they've used on the, uh, especially the bottom heatsink, where I literally had to use a pair of pliers just to try and get this uh, socket out because it was so tight on there, I couldn't uh, loosen it with my finger and I don't have a, a wrench that small to be able to uh, crack the head itself. And then that sort of just, it was really tedious to do that when they don't need to implement this double screw design. Though testing out the heatsink itself showed that the temperatures dropped drastically on an M.2 drive, similar to that of the ASRock board. However, one problem that I did find, and this will relate to the BIOS itself, was that I couldn't boot from my normal SSD once the NVMe was installed. And even though I changed the settings manually in the BIOS, it didn't save the settings themselves. And I updated to the latest BIOS as well, which you also have to uh, manually download from the website, use their uh, QFlash utility. So I would like to see them implement an internet download for quick and easy updating of the BIOS, but also tune their BIOS to save settings in uh, properly, at least with the boot order. And so I had to actually delete the NVMe drive over again and start over again to get this to boot properly 
from my SSD. So going through the rest of the BIOS, there's no RGB control, though the overclocking features for both CPU and also memory are definitely there, where it's easy to overclock both. However, as I said before, I'd like to see them fine tune that voltage and have them running at spec rather than overvolting drastically. And then the last feature in the BIOS that I really like is the smart fan tuning utility, where you can individually control the speeds of each of the total of five PWM four pin fan headers. So moving through the rest of the features here, we've got addressable RGB 5 volt as well as 12 volt RGB headers, one each at the top and bottom for four in total. And then we've got a USB 3 front out and a USB type C front out, six SATA ports and five PCIe slots in total. Three of those being 16X slots, but their actual speeds is the top one is only a true 16X and then the one in the middle an 8X and then the one at the bottom of 4X. And then in between we have two 1X slots. Then moving on to the rear of the board here, we've got an integrated IO shield and a whopping 10 USB ports in total, as well as a PS2 combo port, HDMI out and DisplayPort 1.4. They've also got manual surround out here, but they are missing the optical out plug, which I do like on a motherboard personally. And there's no M.2 slot for Wi-Fi, neither are there cutouts for the antennas there. So I would like to see those two things implemented on a 200 USD motherboard. Then they've included an Intel 2.5G NIC solution and testing out the USB 3 speeds and those NIC speeds showed that nothing was wrong whatsoever. Then of course, the last thing to talk about and we'll roll this in with the conclusion is the color scheme here. They've got a really nice aesthetic going on. And that of course is white and sliver, <laughs> or should I say silver? So they have made that typo there on the heat sink. I'm not sure how much that would bother you. It hasn't bothered me much at all, but I just thought it was really funny uh, to see that in practice. Though for what it's worth, the board does look really nice. There is some RGB lighting on the outer edge of the board here, right near the IO shield, and that's about it. So really clean aesthetic, and they have added in some steel armor on the top PCIe slot, as well as the DDR4 memory slots just to really sort of give it that premium look. And at the end of the day, that's what I always feel about Gigabyte motherboards. I feel like they give you a lot of hardware for the dollar, but they do miss the fine tuning on some of the things, but ultimately you do get pretty good value for money. This board is no different. We saw with the VRM, it was handling that 10900K absolutely fine. And for a 200 US dollar board, to handle roughly 300 watts of power is quite impressive. And it wasn't really going into any scary territory there. And then the M.2 speeds, they checked out. Everything else on the board checked out fine, though there were those little uh, quirks, of course, not having optical out on the sound, as well as having that uh, PCIe issue for the NVMe and the BIOS, and then having it over vaulting a little bit. So I would like to see some of these things corrected in the future, uh, whether it be in a BIOS update or a revision of this motherboard. And I think that have an absolute winner on their hands, even though they've got one right here in terms of if you're looking for the aesthetic and you've got that $200 price point, you wanna get something that's really nice. And I think we'll stop right there with this board. Basically, it's a solid board. It's not the best I've seen, but of course it's far from the worst I've seen either. And if you guys enjoyed today's review, then be sure to hit that like button for us. And also let us know in the comments section below what you're thinking about Z4 90 and 10th gen so far, just like this question of the day, which comes from Aaron Taz. And they ask, Brian, what's your opinion about the review that Steve did today? Uh, so basically, uh, Steve from Gamers Nexus did a video on the 10 400, and basically it was the opposite opinion to what I said. I thought it was a great value CPU. He's basically saying, don't buy it. And his reason is that the 2666 megahertz memory is going to be a limit on the H410 and B460 motherboards. For me personally, I'm gonna wait until those motherboards come out and see what it's all about, if we're able to tune those timings. And of course, if we're able to lock in XMP profiles and just have them run at lower speeds, or if we might even get the full speeds. Who knows, it remains to be seen. But one thing I did notice about that review was that he used different memory in the 3200 mega CL14 versus the 2666 stuff. So I'm not sure what you're doing there, Steve. You should be using the same memory and just clocking it down to 2666 for a fair comparison because I looked at some of those differences and they were pretty big. And I'm, I mean, if you got the CL14 stuff and you maybe dropped it down to CL13 or CL12, 2666, 
you'd probably be looking at a lot less of a difference. Anyhow, I'll wait till H410 and B460 motherboards are released, then I'll come back to the CPU and we'll recheck that out for you guys. But in the meantime, my opinion still stands. I think in the 10th gen lineup and what I saw out of that chip here at the studio, I thought it's impressive value for money coming from Intel. I also said the Ryzen 5 3600, you buy either of these CPUs, you can't go wrong. So that's just my opinion. Take it how it is. And that's about it for this video. If you've stayed this far and you're enjoying that content and you want to see at the moment it drops, then hit that sub button, ring that bell, and you'll get the videos as soon as they drop. And I'll catch you in the next tech video very soon. Peace out for now. Bye. Dad man, I'll do you one better. In the cryptocurrency world, Bitcoin is considered gold and Litecoin is considered... Sliver.